Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Pro-Life success. The governor of Oklahoma celebrates signing nine new pro-life bills into law and joins us here. What he is saying about whether his state's heartbeat law will be enacted. Plus, Representative Stephanie Bice of Oklahoma continues the discussion on the pro-life momentum in her state. Making a statement, Teen Vogue's editor-in-chief and a U.S. representative donned pro-abortion fashion statements at this year's Met Gala. We tell you about the abortion message accessory and address the dress. The true dignity of life and death. A Dominican friar who is also a physician tells us about a new book helping Catholics to overcome temptations we face when we approach death and how we can best prepare for that moment. We are so close to this common goal to protect life and declare that all innocent life uh, has an equal right uh, to life. That is Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt at a ceremonial bill signing last week where he celebrated the nine pro-life bills he signed into law during the 2021 session. That's right, nine. Most of the pro-life laws will go into effect starting November 1st, though abortion groups are suing to block five of them. We'll put the new laws up on the screen for you. The new wide-ranging pro-life laws include a ban on abortion if Roe versus Wade is overturned, a heartbeat law that would ban abortion once a baby's heartbeat is detected. Two new laws provide safeguards to dangerous abortion-inducing drugs. A new law extends the age a baby can be relinquished to medical providers. And one new law, Lily's Law, will require birthing centers and medical facilities to keep a written policy so families can direct the disposition of their stillborn or miscarried baby's remains. I spoke with Oklahoma Governor Stitt last week immediately following the ceremonial bill signing. Here's our interview. Joining us now is Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt. Governor, welcome to the show and congratulations on your pro-life success. You have signed nine pro-life state bills into law this year, including a law to protect babies from abortion once an unborn child's heartbeat is detected. Governor, how does your state's law compare to Texas's heartbeat law, and are you optimistic it will also be enacted? You know, we are. Uh, you know, I want to be the most pro-life governor in the country, and uh, passing this heartbeat law, um, we, you know, I work with the House, the Senate, just really glad to get it across the finish line. The difference is, with Texas, there's some civil penalties. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be challenged. I mean, we always have uh, left-wing groups coming into our state, filing lawsuits, trying to prevent uh, the will of the people in the state of Oklahoma from going forward. So it'll probably be challenged, but we're very hopeful with, with what you're seeing nationally and then the Supreme Court, uh, you know, looking at the Mississippi law. Um, we're, we're pretty optimistic this will stand. That's great to hear. And one of the new nine pro-life laws prohibits fetal trafficking. I'm curious, was that inspired by David Daleiden's undercover Planned Parenthood videos? You know, the, the legislature, I'm sure that has, uh, that goes into some of their thought process when they pass those laws. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it just, it's common sense to us in Oklahoma that we're not going to uh, traffic that. And so making that a law is just, uh, it's common sense for us in Oklahoma. And uh, we, we that, that's why we believe in states' rights. I mean, our four million Oklahomans uh, that put me in office and we're enacting the will of the people in the state of Oklahoma, we don't believe the federal government and federal overreach should come in and tell us how to live our lives in Oklahoma. Mm. A number of pro-abortion groups, including several Planned Parenthood affiliates, are, are suing to block five of these new pro-life laws. What's your response to their claim that these pro-life laws are unconstitutional? Well, you know, again, we believe that uh, we have the right in Oklahoma to enact our laws, and uh, I'm elected by all four million Oklahomans. And for these out-of-state groups to come in and try to challenge these, uh, we just think it's preposterous. And uh, we are looking forward to the Supreme Court pushing this issue back to the states where it belongs and not making this a federal issue. We ultimately believe that 
uh, you know, life begins at conception and uh, we want to protect all life in Oklahoma. Mm. In your opinion, speaking of Oklahomans, do these nine new pro-life laws have the support of Oklahoma residents? Absolutely. You know, when you look at uh, our legislature, and, and these passed overwhelmingly, probably 80% uh, of our legislature uh, passed. I'd have to look at individually at all the different bills, but uh, around 80% uh, uh, passing. And so those folks are individually elected across our state. And uh, so I think it's an overwhelming uh, issue that uh, is supported by the majority of Oklahomans. 2021 has been a very successful year for the pro-life laws at the state level. More than 80 new pro-life laws enacted at the state level this year so far. Governor, what role do you see pro-life governors such as yourself having in advancing a culture of life, especially amid a pro-abortion majority in U.S. Congress and with a pro-abortion president of the United States? You know, I, I mean, I, I think it comes down to how our Constitution was set up. I mean, we have 50 different uh, uh, individual states, and we believe in the Tenth Amendment. And we should, if, if California wants to govern one way and, and Oklahoma, the people uh, want to do something different, uh, that's our right. And so I think with you're going to see more states step up saying, this is who we are, and, uh, and, and, and we're going to be a, we're going to be a pro-life state. Um, and so I, I think you're seeing Mississippi and you're seeing Texas, you're seeing Oklahoma, you're seeing some other conservative states that have different values maybe uh, than folks on the coast. And, um, and so we're going to continue to st stand up. And as long as I'm governor, I'll protect our way of life and our values uh, in the state of Oklahoma. You have six children. Governor, can you speak to the gift of life and openness to life in your family? Yeah, my wife and I, we've been married for 23 years. And, and uh, you know, with our first child, I remember uh, with Natalie, my oldest, when we saw that first ultrasound, uh, this issue came alive to me and, and, and growing up in Oklahoma. Uh, but once you see and you hear that heartbeat and you see that ultrasound uh, of that human life, uh, it really uh, is preposterous to think that it's okay to take a life and, uh, and that's why this is such an important issue to me and, and uh, really my colleagues in the House, the Senate, and the majority of Oklahomans. Well, you have a beautiful family, and you have promised to sign every piece of pro-life legislation that comes to your desk. I have to ask, when did you become pro-life, and is defending the unborn a priority for you? Yeah, you know, when I, I, was, I never ran for office until 2018. I was in the business world, and, um, and on the campaign trail, this issue became more and more real as you start realizing that uh, if you're fortunate enough to become governor, you have to set the, the vision and the standard for the state. And, uh, and then I go back to my own children and, and being in those rooms and seeing those ultrasounds at an early age, I mean, six, eight weeks, uh, there's a heartbeat, and that is a, uh, a living uh, person. And, and so, you know, we determined right then that I was going to sign every piece of pro-life legislation. Mm -hmm. We were going to continue to lead on this issue. Uh, we're on the right side of this morally. Uh, we're on the right side of this issue. And, uh, you know, we, we would challenge anybody to, to debate why it's okay to take a life. Mm. Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt, thank you so much for your time. And again, congratulations on your pro-life success. Thank you. After we spoke with Governor Stitt, news broke this week that Oklahoma's Pardon and Parole Board recommended the governor commute the death sentence of Julius Jones for a 1999 killing. Jones has maintained his innocence, and the board voted three to one to recommend he be sentenced to life in prison and not receive the death penalty. It will ultimately be Governor Stitt to decide Jones's fate. Pope Francis in 2018 revised the catechism's teaching on the death penalty to make it inadmissible. Now to continue our conversation on pro-life laws in the Sooner State, we're joined over Zoom by U.S. Representative Stephanie Bice of Oklahoma. Congresswoman, welcome to the show. First, Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a joy to have you. First, what is your reaction that your governor, Governor Stitt, recently signed nine pro-life bills into law in your state? 
you know, it's exciting to know that um, this state is continuing to do what we can to protect life. Uh, I served in the state legislature uh, in the Senate before elect being elected to Congress, and uh, I fought for those same issues um, while I served in that capacity and look forward to doing the same on the federal level. But uh, we live in a pro-life state, and the governor is continuing to support that um, very important work. As you mentioned, you previously served in the Oklahoma State Senate before being elected a U.S. representative. Can you speak more to why do state lawmakers matter when it comes to the pro-life cause? This is something you know firsthand. Absolutely. You know, there are ways, there are laws that you can put in place really to uh, not only protect life, uh, whether that be waiting periods or um, in some cases, you know, in Oklahoma, we uh, had a minor consent bill that was put into place. Uh, but also to support life, whether that is offering tax credits for foster and adoption um, services or making sure that families are supported. All of these things are pro-life issues, uh, and I'm proud that um, I was able to support so many of those causes. There have been a lot of pro-life successes at the state level this year, but turning to Capitol Hill, a historic number of pro-life women were elected to the U.S. House this congressional term, yourself included. But Congresswoman, are your pro-life voices being heard? Can that contingency of solid pro-life women in the House make a difference in what legislation passes and which legislation doesn't? You know, um, it's an exciting time to be a conservative uh, woman in Congress right now. As you mentioned, uh, there are more women serving on the Republican side uh, than ever before. And we're really uh, pushing back on the pro-choice uh, narrative. And I think it's really um, come to light because of this most recent freshman class. I was incredibly honored to be elected freshman class president. I'm the first female ever to hold that role uh, for the Republican side. And um, we are all trying to ensure that uh, laws stay in place and that lives are protected, including the Hyde Amendment, mm -hmm. which has become a really, um, you know, sticking point for members of Congress right now. We continue to see um, the administration push for pro-choice initiatives, and I think it really is incumbent upon us to educate um, you know, our constituencies on why the pro-life issue is so incredibly important and how we're fighting back against um, the other side. Mm. Congresswoman, I understand you are Catholic. How does your faith shape your pro-life beliefs, and do you believe that life begins at conception? You know, it's incredibly important that we, um, you know, that I, uh, in my faith, uh, you know, stick to those values and hold on to that. And I, you know, from the very beginning, I'm actually a Catholic convert. Um, so I learned, I think, a lot about um, how the, the church sees life, whether it's conception or natural death. Um, and I'm proud to support um, the, the policies that we're fighting for uh, in Congress. It's so good to have you in the church. We have about a minute left, Congresswoman, but I'd love to ask you about this. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, also a Catholic, is now calling for a vote on the Women's Health Protection Act, which would expand abortion on demand. How would you vote on that piece of legislation? Well, that's an easy one. I would vote no, uh, as would uh, so many of my colleagues, if not all of them. And I actually think that you have a lot of uh, moderate uh, Democrats on the other side that are really pushing back on uh, the radical pro-choice narrative that uh, the left keeps pushing. Look, uh, the Roe versus Wade was a very sort of narrow ruling, and, I, and I'm happy to see that states like Mississippi and Texas, certainly, and others are really trying to force this issue to the forefront again and reevaluate uh, what it means to um, offer uh, pro-life initiatives mm -hmm. or be pro-choice. That's a, a real important conversation that needs to happen sooner rather than later. If we're going to continue to support uh, life, we need to have that protection on the federal level, too. Well, thank you so much for your leadership and for your time. Representative Stephanie Bice of Oklahoma, thank you. Thank you. We are now joined on Skype by Sue Liebel, State Policy Director for the Susan B. Anthony List. Sue, welcome back. As you heard earlier, Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt held a ceremonial bill signing to celebrate the nine pro-life bills he signed into law this year so far. I know Susan B. Anthony List President Marjorie Dannenfelser was present for, there, for that occasion. Sue, how significant is this to have nine new laws? It's bold, isn't it? Uh, Governor Stitt is at the forefront of really a national momentum to challenge the status quo and modernize our extreme abortion laws. Across the nation, pro-life governors are taking bold action to ensure that state laws reflect the will of their constituents 
and the clear science that today shows the humanity of unborn children. Mm. Um, as the radical Democrats in Washington push abortion on demand, paid by our tax dollars, and they want to expand those dangerous abortion drugs. Now, strong pro-life leaders in the state houses are critically important, and they're stepping up like never before. Out of these nine new laws, are there specific ones that you would like to draw attention to for our viewers? Yeah, yeah they're all strong, but I'd like to uh, point out they included a heartbeat bill. Mm -hmm. We've heard a lot about the Texas heartbeat bill, but uh, Governor Stitt just signed a heartbeat bill, too. Um, also, um, a prohibition for Oklahoma that would prohibit abortion if and when Roe versus Wade is overturned. It's very strategic, actually, right now, in anticipation of the U.S. Supreme Court's upcoming uh, review of the Mississippi law, the Dobbs case, which could have the potential of overturning or severely restricting Roe. So here, Governor Stitt's getting ahead of that and prohibiting abortion uh, for his state. And then there were two other bills that also were very strategic to get ahead of President Biden's radical attempts to expand abortion, this time through the Food and Drug Administration, we're expecting that the FDA will roll back the health and safety standards on the dangerous chemical mm -hmm. abortion pills. And so Governor Stitt's two bills were signed to implement um, strong restrictions and um, safety protocols in the state of Oklahoma. So important. And what's probably no surprise, pro-abortion groups have filed a lawsuit against the state in an effort to overturn five of the nine pro-life bills. So what should viewers expect? Do you think we will see Oklahoma be able to enact a heartbeat law? Well, I'll tell you, this is not surprising, um, as these, these laws really bite into a huge chunk of the abortion industry's profits. The Supreme Court has, in the past, allowed states to regulate abortion to various degrees. So they likely will not win on all those suits uh, or against all those bills. But the Mississippi um, Dobbs case that I mentioned earlier will have a profound effect on the heartbeat bill, uh, for example, and also that prohibition. So we're going to want to watch that later this year, early next year, um, at the national level to see what the U.S. Supreme Court's going to do. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if these cases, you know, linger until that is decided. That's such a good point. Sue, we have about a minute left, but while I have you, what does all this reveal about the important role of pro-life governors right now? You know, that can't be overstated right now. And, and actually, they're stepping up. So far this year, there have been almost 500 um, pro-life bills advanced in state legislatures. And as of um, June 1st, um, about 90 of them have been signed into law. Nearly one in five of the pro-life bills that were advanced have been enacted into law. And that's not just, you know, Governor Stitt, uh, Texas Governor Abbott, uh, Montana Governor Greg Gianforte, South Dakota Dakota Governor Nome, heck, McMaster, South Carolina, Kemp, Georgia. I could go on. Mm -hmm. And actually, we, see, we could expect this to heat up even more and watch uh, the radical abortion lobby push back very hard, because Obviously, Roe versus Wade is not settled. Hmm. Uh, the states are boldly reacting because it's not workable. And as it gets more radical on the Democrat side and in Washington, the states are stepping up like never before. Absolutely. Great insight, as always. Sue Liebel with the Susan B. Anthony List. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Coming up, Teen Vogue's editor-in-chief draws attention to abortion at this week's Met Gala, and she wasn't the only one. I speak out when we return. Plus, a Dominican friar who is also a physician specializing in internal medicine tells us about his new book and how it will prepare Catholics for life and death. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. A few guests at the Met Gala made a pro-abortion fashion statement. That is this week's Speak Out segment. The annual Met Gala is a major fashion event, and this year some guests tried to dress up abortion. As you can see here, Representative Carolyn Maloney of New York wore a gown in suffragette colors demanding the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. Her gown says equal rights for women, and she's holding an ERA yes clutch. 
The Equal Rights Amendment would enshrine abortion on demand in our Constitution. She wasn't the only one with a pro-abortion message. Teen Vogue editor-in-chief Versha Sharma brought a custom clutch to the Met Gala that said, protect Roe, kill the filibuster. The editor-in-chief explained her fashion decision in Teen Vogue, writing, it's also my first Met as editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue and a good opportunity to introduce myself and my vision for the publication. So tonight, I want to call attention to an extremely urgent issue, the threat to reproductive rights and bodily autonomy in the United States of America. It's one thing to wear a statement dress, but it's another thing to wear an abortion statement. We frequently speak out against Teen Vogue's pro-abortion articles, but now the publication's editor-in-chief is being very forthright that promoting abortion is central to her vision. So much so that she brought a custom Protect Row clutch to her first Met Gala, of course referencing the Supreme Court case Roe v. Wade, which legalized abortion nationwide. And for Representative Maloney's attire, while it seems a dress that says equal rights for women is very pro-woman, you should know that the Equal Rights Amendment is deceptively named as it would enshrine abortion. And we know abortion ends the life of unborn girls and hurts their mothers. Just because there were pro-abortion messages worn at the Met Gala this year, remember, abortion is not and never will be fashionable. A new book by a Dominican friar and physician specializing in internal medicine explores key issues of the Catholic faith and gives guidance on how Catholics can overcome temptations we face as death approaches. In the new book, The Art of Dying, Brother Columba Thomas explains, note that as soon as the sick person perceives that he is tempted against faith, he should consider first how necessary faith is, since without it, no one can be saved. And joining us now is Brother Columba Thomas to talk about the new book, Ars Moriendi, or The Art of Dying. It's a book he translated with introduction and notes. Brother Thomas is a Dominican friar and physician specializing in internal medicine and is currently studying for the priesthood. Brother Columba, welcome to the show and congratulations on this new book. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So this book, The Art of Dying, it has a significant Catholic history. Tell us about that and why we have a new translation today. Sure. So this was a text that was developed in the early 15th century, and it was because there was a great need at the time to help the Catholic faithful to prepare for death and dying. And so the purpose with this book was to reach a very general audience. There were a lot of problems with uh, bubonic plague and unexpected illnesses and deaths at that time. And so there was actually a great shortage of priests and availability of the sacraments. And so this book was basically trying to help people as much as possible to just understand the basics of the faith and what they can do to support those who are seriously ill and dying and to prepare for their own eventual death. We absolutely still need that today in 2021. You know, on this show, we discuss protecting the dignity of life. Is the art of dying about protecting our dignity of life even until those very last moments of life? And brother, can you explain what are some temptations against the faith that we might experience? Sure. So this work is very much focused on the basic Christian message, which is that Christ has overcome death. Mm -hmm. And so that in faith, we can keep our eyes fixed on him and have the expectation of eternal life mm -hmm. uh, once we've uh, passed on into the next life. Um, and so basically this book uh, features a number of challenges that people may face, temptations or interior struggles that they may have to deal with as they're approaching death. And it offers really helpful, encouraging responses to that. These temptations are organized in terms of virtues and vices. So the three first temptations are against faith, hope, and charity, which are the theological virtues, and they're all about our relationship with God. And so it's a great danger, obviously, if we're tempted to resist those um, as the end approaches. And so the response is to maintain our faith in God and to hope in our salvation and to 
accept God's love and respond to it with love in return. That's so important. There is a spiritual battle for our soul. Mm -hmm. So it's important to keep our guard up until those very last moments. And protecting life is important from womb to tomb. Brother Columba, I'd be interested, what's your response to people who do believe that euthanasia and assisted suicide, that that truly is compassionate care for people who are dying? Mm. I think that this text presents a very positive vision for approaching death and dying. It's all about the Christian message of the dignity of human life and how we can come together and support each other in a very positive way amidst very difficult struggles. Absolutely, and compassion means to suffer with, mm -hmm. and so to be there with someone who is experiencing that. I'd also be interested, you know, how can we best be there for people who are dying? Is there any kind of encouragement or any kind of message that we can give to someone who is at that stage in life? So one of the key points of advice that this text offers is the importance of the dying person to recognize a, a close family member or friend who can provide constant support. Um, and that means reminding them about the importance of the faith, making sure that they have all the resources that they need. And I'm not just talking about medical resources, mm -hmm. but prayers and meditations, visitations from priests, and uh, ac access to the sacraments as well. And so there's a lot that we can do, actually, as Christians to support each other and to support those who are struggling with serious illness to make sure that they can have all the resources that are available through the church, but also that they keep their their eyes fixed on Christ throughout all of that. That's a reminder for all of us to always keep our eyes fixed on Christ. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your work, Brother Columba Thomas with the Art of Dying. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And that does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. You can also send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. We love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.